eventually Piggy appears. Presumably it's taken him this long to reach this part of the mountain. He's carrying the conch under his arm. And as I mentioned earlier, this continues to associate him with the values of fairness and democracy. But as he arrives at the woodpile, he's treated to the sort of rough behaviour which must have been characteristic of his time at school. Jack is the first to recognise how Piggy's glasses can be used to make fire. His specs use them as burning glasses. And as you read, you'll get the feeling that Jack is always searching for a way to bully or exploit Piggy. And the fact that he's the first to recognise how the glasses can be used is partly born out of his obvious intelligence and partly born out of his instinct to take from the vulnerable. This is made obvious by the description of Jack snatching the glasses off his face, along with the shrieks of terror from Piggy. But notice here how, along with his own distress at having his glasses taken from him, Piggy is just as fearful for the safety of the conch. Piggy's close association with the conch and all the values that it represents will grow and grow as the novel progresses. He will be the protector of free speech and democracy. After the fire is lit, the glasses are returned to Piggy. And at this point we can see just how short-sighted he is. His hands are described as groping, as you would if you were searching for something in the dark before he mutters that without them, he can hardly see his own hand. Now, I mentioned earlier about this idea of work and how building a fire, along with building the shelters, which I'll come to in the next chapter, come to represent this daily toil of working. And this section, which I've got here, illustrates this struggle, uh, along with being a good place to pause and have a look at some of the language devices Golden uses to describe it. So firstly, there is the metaphorical idea that uh, life has now become uh, a race with the fire as the boys rush to add more firewood at a rate faster than the flames can burn it. Golding is fantastic at using sound effects through alliteration to enable the reader to experience what is going on. Now, the repetition of consonant sounds at the beginning of a sequence of words is called alliteration. But where the F sound is repeated as here to keep a clean flag of flame flying, these are called fricatives. And in combination, they create the whipping sound, like the flames cracking in the wind. The violence and danger inherent in the fire is suggested by the metaphor here, which compares the fire, uh, the heat of the fire, to a savage arm reaching out and striking the boys, like perhaps an angry teacher would have done in Golding's day. There are a couple of images here which suggest the physical impact that this work is having on the boys and therefore why this novelty is quite quick to wear off. Here the boys are described as exhausted and then at the end of the paragraph where Golding uses a simile to compare the boys to tired panting dogs slumping themselves down in ungainly fashion in front of the remains of the fire. The end of the fire is described using another run of consonant sounds, this time S's with the soft cindery sound scent etc. And this technique is called sibilance and here it's used to represent the hissing sound of a fire at the end of its life collapsing in on itself. This is the point where Piggy's intelligence backs fires. Piggy is quick to point out to the others that there is no way a fire of that size and power could be kept alight. It would consume too much fuel and too much manpower to keep it going. But Notice how he is not the only one to be critical of the fire. Ralph, too, points out a mistake in the boy's method. He says that was no good. 
and that there was no smoke. Yet it is Piggy who Jack chooses to attack with a fat lot of you tried. And this is what I meant earlier by saying that you just get the feeling that Jack is searching for ways to attack Piggy. Jack is a bully and Piggy is a victim of bullying. They've fallen into these roles on the island as easily as if they were on a playground at school. And so Golding is showing how basic human behaviour will have an impact on the boys, despite the fact that they are hundreds, if not thousands of miles away from the environments which first created it. It's probably worth pointing out that uh, one of the boys who does come to Piggy's defence is Simon. He says we used his specs. He helped that way. Now, Simon is the quiet, sensitive boy who had fainted in chapter one. He points out the way that Piggy had been useful. And we'll see in the next chapter how Piggy is not the only ignored outsider that Simon will seek to uh, protect. Piggy persists with his refrain of, I got the conch throughout this extract, and the arrogance of Jack is on show again. As he invents new rules, the conch doesn't count on this side of the mountain purely as a way of trying to silence Piggy. I've chosen this section to have a quick look at before the climax to the chapter because of the important consequences it has for the plot as a whole. In it, Jack offers not only to make the choir responsible for keeping the fire going, uh, but also makes them responsible for keeping lookout. And on the surface, this seems quite a generous and logical thing to do. After all, many of the older boys who survived the crash seem to belong to this group of boys. However, this does give Jack an enormous amount of power. And the role of keeping the life-saving fire going will only stay a priority as long as it is a priority for Jack. The climax to the chapter is undoubtedly the point where the fire gets out of control and the consequences of it. Just to make this explicit, the boys are on a mountain and down one side of the mountain is an area where the soil is comparatively thin and so the palm trees are unable to get a secure footing. So they fall down and die when they reach a certain height. This is the area where they've been gathering all of their wood for the fire in the middle of the chapter. This whole area is tinder dry and fuel for burning is plentiful. The fire which the boys built on the mountain was so massive that the wind has carried a spark or some other still burning material down the side of the mountain and set fire to this supply of wood. Piggy is the first person to spot what is happening, who says with bitter irony, you got your small fire. The spread of the fire is described here using an exciting range of devices, most notably the use of increasingly wild and savage animal images, from the leaping of a squirrel, the gnawing of perhaps a beaver, to the stalking creep of a jaguar, the flapping of birds, and the leaping and swinging of monkeys. All of this is meant to illustrate the way that the fire grows and spreads, but it suggests something about the path that the boys are on, as they too will become increasingly wild and savage the longer that they spend on the island. From a language analysis point of view, it's worth going through some of this description and identifying the devices. Remember that simile is where a comparison is made using the words as or like, like where we've got the crept as a jaguar creeps, which I've identified as number three here. And this compares 
the flames as they crawl across the ground to a hunting jaguar searching for prey. Metaphor is a direct comparison where something is described as if it is something else, like the squirrel leapt, which I've identified as number two. So here the flames are a squirrel leaping between the trees of the forest. Alliteration, remember, is the repetition of consonant sounds in a sequence of words. And remember that this combination can create quite interesting sound effects too. So notice here, like I've indicated in red, how many times the F sound is repeated, which creates the sound called fricatives. And they create that angry, rasping sound of lashing flames. The reaction to all of this from the boys is mixed. Many of them, to begin with, break into shrill and excited cheering before being struck into silence by the power and the ferocious energy that they have unleashed. But Piggy is afraid. Afraid of the fire, perhaps, but also afraid of the carelessness of the boys in allowing the fire to get out of control and all its savage consequences. It's also Piggy who realises that they've now destroyed all of their firewood. I mentioned in an earlier video on chapter one how an important theme in the novel is division. The scar created by the crash-landed plane is one of the first ways in which this division is created. Well, the fire on the mountain is another as there is now one side of the mountain that is burnt and one side which is not. And from now on, this patch will be known as the unfriendly side of the mountain, while the acres of ashes which remain long after the fire has gone out will take on even greater significance in the second half of the novel. But the chapter isn't over yet. Piggy is about to make his most important, dramatic and shocking observation so far, one which at the end of the chapter causes him to have an attack of asthma. He realises that some of the little ones, the youngest boys whom no one had been paying much attention to, well, some of them had been wandering about down there where the fire is the most significant of whom is the boy with the mulberry-coloured birthmark who first mentioned the beast, who wanted to know if it was going to come back and said it wanted to eat him. Piggy speaks desperately. That little and him with the mark on his face, I don't see him. Where is he now? And that's the thing about having a large, distinctive mark on your face. In spite of the number of boys who have landed on the island, few of them who know each other, and despite the lack of attention that the younger boys had been given, if that one in particular goes missing, everyone is going to notice. And in the absence of adults to make sense of the situation, the boys especially the younger ones, will create their own narrative. And this narrative is assisted by something else. One of the geographical features on the island are the thick creepers or vines which climb up the trees and create tangles in the forest. Piggy first mentions them at the beginning of chapter one when he's asking Ralph to slow down. Well, these creepers have caught fire too, and as a tree explodes, they become detached, rise into view, and the little ones see these and think they look like snakes. A tree exploded in the fire like a bomb. Tall swathes of creepers rose for a moment into view, agonised and went down again, the little boys screamed at them, snakes, snakes, 
Look at the snakes. So now the credibility of the beast story has been enhanced. The boy with the mulberry coloured birthmark who was so afraid of being eaten has disappeared in an area of the island full of snakes. This recognition is immediately juxtaposed with the setting sun, causing the faces of the boys to be lit redly from beneath like devils. And the connection between snakes and devils is key to your wider understanding of the book and Golding's intention in writing it.